Rod Babers joins us, 365 Sports. Rod, a part of the Texas football analyst on Texas football and also on the horn during Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. with Craig and Paul. I'm David Smoke. Rod, thanks for your time. We have Jonathan Brooks, Quinn Ewers' future. And then I saw your tweet. Texas, they aren't yet a four-quarter team, but they're a fourth-quarter team. Your thoughts about what you've seen, they've been able to move and survive and move on. And again, the win on Saturday in Fort Worth against TCU. Yeah, I mean, this is a team, right? Keep in mind, last year, they were outscored in the fourth quarter overtime combined. Uh, and they were losing uh, fourth quarters uh, egregiously. And now, you know, I know the last couple of weeks, obviously, they uh, lost the fourth quarter. But if you go look at it overall, they found a way to win and, and make clutch plays in critical moments. That's something, guys, they were not doing last season. And I think it is a sign of growth for the team. Now, I will admit that they are, this is a team that, you know, they play spectacular stretches of, of football, right? Probably 12 to maybe 12 minutes to 15 minutes in a game. But there's also going to be a similar stretch of football in that very same game, kind of the best of times and the worst of times, where they're going to have, you know, lows, mental errors. They're going to have lapses in focus. And they're going to play distracted almost, almost play like they're complacent. And it happens usually when Texas has a lead or they're up in games. We've seen it three of the last four games, take away a 20-plus point lead and allow their opponents to come back into the game. Yet they've been able to win it on either a game-winning goal line stand or they've been able to win it with a clutch play like A.D. Mitchell's catch. So the concern is, is that, yes, they are a team that finds a way to win games in clutch moments, but they are trending toward another loss because their worst stretches of football – are starting to come at the end of these games in the fourth quarter, and it's only a you know a matter of time before you know walking this tightrope between destiny and disaster is going to come back to haunt the horn. I like that, Rod. The tightrope between destiny and disaster uh, is that's 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 good. Um, you know, the, the disaster of this week is about Jonathan Brooks. I mean, he was. Um, established himself as the bell cow of the offense and in the s- slowest most sluggish times he could keep the you know the the chains moving and things churning now they certainly have some depth behind them of guys that they that they believe in and like but how big of a loss is this for Texas given how well he was playing it, and guys I'm not gonna lie to you it's devastating it's absolutely devastating I mean think about it you had the best running back room in the country last season with Bijan and Rojo, and it was understandable. Everybody went, okay, that's going to be a drop-off when Bijan and Rojo are drafted. Of course there are, because you had the best running back room in the country. How can there not be some type of regression? And the truth is, because of Jonathan Brooks, by the way, a guy who didn't even start the first two games, guys, he didn't win the running back competition. <laughs> and uh, he actually persevered, and because C.K. Baxter couldn't finish the entire game without getting dinged up, Jonathan Brooks comes in, and it's probably one of the biggest and most pleasant surprises of the season for the Longhorns, maybe of, of the college football season. He was a front runner, guys, for the Doak Walker Award. He was he was on his on his way to definitely being a finalist, but he had a good shot to win the award for being the best running back in the country. Statistically, through 10 games, he had actually had stats that were better or comparable to B. John Robinson. Um, so the truth is, guys, he had been uh, the MVP on offense. There's no doubt about it, because nobody thought that you would have – a uh, running game as potent as this. And now, without him, you got C.J. Bass, who's a guy to admit he's healthy now but couldn't make it through an entire game early in the season. And he's a freshman. You also got Jaden Blue, who's explosive, but, you know, he's a guy that can run on the perimeter and on the edge. I don't expect him to be a guy that can hurt you uh, in the interior runs. Uh, he's not a power running game guy. They got Fabian Red, who was running the Red Cat, their version of the Wildcat. They'll probably have to now put him more of a traditional role at running back. And then there's Keelan Robinson, who didn't play last week, and we don't really know his status. So the truth is, guys, Starks will have to get really innovative and very creative about how to juice up his running game. Now, it wouldn't be a problem because I would assume Starks normally would just pivot to being a pass-first team, and why not? you got a quarterback that's one of the better young quarterbacks in the country, and Quinn Ewers, he's back. you got the whole complement of weapons, the X-Man, A.G. Mitchell, and J.T. Sanders. Nobody in the conference can really line up and cover the man-to-man, but he's not healthy either. And now you're dealing with him with an issue about the severity of his injury. So I'm not sure you can throw it 40 times in a game without exposing your quarterback too much injury. So here's the conundrum. You don't have a potent running game, and you can't totally lean on the pass without exposing, potentially re-injuring your starting quarterback. This is what starts makes this money. 
Man, that is interesting. And, uh, you know, not a team that's uh, the most fun to play probably, Rod, huh? When you're t- looking at, like, how can we attack a defense and we're not quite 100%. Let's go play Matt Campbell and, you know, that defensive staff and those minds over there in Ames. <laughs> exactly right. I'm with you. Guys, John Haycock, listen, we talked about the three high three down defense and Texas has actually faced that, that scheme um, the last three weeks, right? K State runs a version of it. TCU runs a version of three high three down. It's probably the most popular defense in the Big 12, but nobody has popularized the three high three down quite like John Haycock. And here's the thing, guys, I've studied it. And if you look at Stark's um, offensive productivity since he's been the play caller slash head coach at Texas, um, his, uh, his offenses are less effective. They're less efficient and they're less explosive versus the three high three down defense. There's no doubt about it. I've done the numbers. Essentially, we're talking about scoring a touchdown less per game on average versus three high three down defenses. And now you're going into aim on the road. First true road test since Alabama, guys. The truth is, all their road games have been in the state of Texas, right? You just you were in you were in H Town. Hell, half of that crowd was uh, Texas fans. You were in Fort Worth. About a third to probably, you know, a little bit more of that crowd were Longhorn fans. You had the Texas OU game. That's a neutral site. So now you got a true road test. Uh, that's a little bit concerning. Last time you were in Ames, you were embarrassed. And that's also an issue. And you got the injuries that are all creeping up the Longhorns. That's the injuries on defense, too. Guys, today, Barron got nicked up in that TCU game. He's probably your third best defensive player behind Savandre Sweat and Jalen Ford. So we don't really know his status. And, of course, the injuries on offense. So I got to tell you, I'm a little concerned considering the way the Longhorns have been playing lately. This is a game where I would say can choke the life out of the clock, play really good defense, and potentially make this a fourth quarter game and then anything can happen. Rod, uh, sticking on, on Quinn there, I mean, you saw the reports inside Texas uh, mentioning that the odds, I guess, are favoring that Quinn Ewers could come back uh, next season, or that's the way that he's leaning. And uh, we were having a conversation the other day of just uh, before we, we knew there'd be any word on, on, you know, potentially with Quinn here anytime soon, but just the number of impact underclassmen that they have. Like, they could have a massive draft class, or they could have a massive bunch of guys come back next year and, like, a top three team to start the season in the SEC. But uh, with Quinn, um, I mean, any thoughts just on, on his game this year and kind of where he fits and just any of the conversation about that, uh, that NFL aspiration? Yeah, I think what – listen, he's been fast-tracked, right, his entire career. It seems like his family and uh, his circle, they fast-tracked him. That's why he left high school early and went to Ohio State and then left Ohio State, transferred, came to Texas. And I believe now, because of the depth of this upcoming quarterback class, it's supposed to be historically deep. Right? He's talking about specifically five, six quarterbacks drafted in the first round. I don't know if his play has, has been the reason his stock has dropped. Uh, as draft stock is dropped, I think it's ultimately just the depth of the class, right? Supply and demand. So I think now he's probably being mocked second, maybe even third round when he was being mocked prior to the season in the first round. And I think he's probably been a guy projected to be a first rounder since, you know, since he was a high school uh, junior, something like that, right? Uh, so I think now his people are thinking, okay, well, if he's going to be a second or third rounder in this deep quarterback class, how about we wait till 2025 potentially? And then he'll, in a you know less crowded quarterback class, he'll potentially rise to the top of that, that draft class. Now, the, the problem is you're going to lose all your receivers pretty much. X-Man is gone. A.D. Mitchell is gone. J.T. Sanders is probably gone. J.J. J. Witt, John, Jordan Winston is probably gone as well. And you're going to bring back a lot of your offensive linemen. Probably only one offensive lineman is going to lead. That's Christian Jones. So you'll bring back that group. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have to go find some receivers in the transfer portal, which Texas could do. So if he comes back, You've got to, you know, understand that he's going to be bringing up a young core of receivers, and that may affect his, you know, productivity as a quarterback. But there's no doubt about it. This is a first world problem, gentlemen. We talk about potentially <laughs> Quinn Jewett coming back, and then you'll have Malik Murphy and Art Manning. You know, you know that the blue chip transfer rate is around 65 percent. So you know he's not going to be keep all of those guys. But man, what a first world problem to have that you could end up either having Quinn come back, a veteran quarterback, or hey, man, you got to hand it over to. Arch Manning potentially uh, for the future. So Texas is in a good position no matter what Quinn chooses, but I think Quinn's trying to keep his options open because now he thinks I can, he can come back to school potentially with NIL, make as much money if he would have made mm-hmm. as a second or a third round pick in the league. Rod, if in fact that does occur, did Malik Murphy do enough on tape or film or whatever uh, to, to be a hot commodity inside the transfer portal if in fact he even looks at that, at that option based on how the dominoes uh, fall? 
Yeah, I think he has done enough. I mean, the reports were after the spring game, there were several Power 5 programs that were, obviously, they weren't supposed to. They were just tampering, uh, but they, they were making inquiries. And that's why Texas decided to up their NIL package to Malik Murphy to keep him on campus. That's, that's not the only reason he stayed. He wants to be here, but there's no question. Guys, he's a West Coast guy. How many quarterbacks in the Pac-12 are leaving? <laughs> I'm leaving their school. That's the most loaded quarterback conference in the country right now. So he could easily go to one of those Pac-12 schools, be closer to home. And I think he's uh, he's gotten some film now out there in a real game that he'll have someone interested. Uh, the truth is, I do think he's going to end up being odd man out, especially if Quinn Lewis comes back. He's going to be the guy that's odd man out, in my opinion. You've got the celebrity quarterback for the first family of football in Arch Manning. Guys, I was on campus with Chris Sims and the Major Applewhite. It's something about a celebrity quarterback, guys. They usually end up on the field sooner rather than later. Y'all know that. <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Pac-12. Bo Nix will be gone. Michael Penix will be gone. Caleb Williams, Williams will, will be gone. And, uh, you, I mean, UCLA has a, a young freshman but might have a new coach. So there's yeah. that's just those four schools right there that are all going to the Big Ten that could that could have wide open doors for Malik Murphy. Exactly. And he's a West Coast guy. And Stark loves him. I think Stark, honestly, guys, might help him out. He may have one of those situations where Stark actually helps him out, try to find the best spot for him. So Stark's a big fan of what he did by staying with the program, you know, long enough for them to stabilize the quarterback position, even though he had a rough coach. Hey, Rod, thank you very much. Uh, real quickly, if you could do this in a minute, what has been the reaction in Austin to the Jimbo Fisher firing? <laughs> oh, man, it's so good. First of all, uh, we don't want Jeff Trailer to go there because Jeff Trailer's <laughs> a damn good coach. So please make a mockery of this, Aggies. Go get Lane Kissing or somebody like that. But we know this is Aggies are sleeping giants. They get this hire right and they got to get it right. Um, they could, that could be a problem for Texas. A lot of people believe that Texas ascent, guys. Texas ascent right now coming back. Maybe the reason that the Aggies with left the Longhorns coming into the SEC next year, maybe that's why they decided, hey, guys, we got to change something. Uh, we got to shake this up. We cannot allow our program to regress while Texas is on the on the comp. So I think that's a, that might be a big part of it. The, the, there's no might or maybe. Thank you very much, Rod. Appreciate it. As always, great, great stuff from Rod Babers. Played the game at Texas, also analyzes UT as they head to Ames for this weekend, Saturday night game, and right now atop the Big 12 at 9-1. Yeah, I wasn't going to 